On May 6, 1999, the U.S. Senate Committee on Energy and Natural Resources reviewed results of a political status plebiscite held in Puerto Rico in December 1998, one in which no single status option on the ballot gained a majority of votes. The statehood option received 46.6 percent of the total vote, while each of the other three status options received less than 3 percent of voter support. A none of the above option gained 50.2 percent of ballots cast. In the previous Congress, the House of Representatives passed H.R. 856, a bill providing congressionally approved language for a plebiscite process. But a companion Senate bill listed as S-472 encountered leadership opposition and did not emerge from committee hearings. Subsequently, the Puerto Rican legislature crafted a ballot for the December plebiscite, one that included four status definitions and a none of the above category required by local law. This recent Senate hearing made clear that the plebiscite vote represented a confusing mix of local political ideology, dissatisfaction with ballot definitions, and a protest vote against current local government policies. Since 1898, when an American expeditionary force took possession of Puerto Rico, its inhabitants have sought a permanent political status. More than a century later, Puerto Rico remains an unincorporated territory of the United States. Even though American citizenship was granted to residents in 1917, numerous attempts over the years to end U.S. colonial policies have failed. The U.S. Congress has yet to create a mechanism by which Puerto Ricans could choose among three available legitimate political status options, U.S. statehood, full independence, or independence in free association with the United States. In 1952, the island was granted local self-government subject to congressional jurisdiction and provisions of the U.S. Constitution. The statute, intended as a temporary measure, precluded Puerto Rican representation in the U.S. Congress and voting rights for president. It also exempted Puerto Ricans from the payment of federal income taxes. A permanent political status, however, continues to elude the 3.8 million American citizens on the island of Puerto Rico. Here lies a fault that must be remedied. Congress must select and fairly define the Puerto Rican status choices it would be prepared to accept. Nothing less will satisfy the obligation to convert an imperial property into a place of dignity for American citizens who are equal in rights to all others. Concerned about fair play for their fellow citizens of Puerto Rico, the leaders of national Hispanic organizations are speaking out on the issue. Good afternoon. At a press conference at the U.S. Capitol, a coalition of Hispanic groups joined to urge passage of the failed Senate bill and to support Puerto Rican aspirations for a congressionally approved plebiscite process. For 100 years, Puerto Rican Americans have fought and died in every effort to preserve those American principles of freedom and democracy, all the while unable to vote for their commander-in-chief or to have representation in Congress. 100 years, the United States has not once asked its citizens in Puerto Rico how they wish to define the relationship with our government. We are concerned about certain code words that are being used to delay or deny the Puerto Rican self-determination process. Some favorites are, there is no time, they are not ready, they are too poor, and their English is deficient. These same words and arguments were used against New Mexico when it sought to become a state. New Mexico Hispanics have lived in New Mexico for 400 years. We still speak Spanish and we have proved ourselves to be outstanding citizens. You know, when you really look at the Hispanic in this country, we're not immigrants. We've been here. And uh, if you look at the island of Cuba or the island of Puerto Rico, that they were there. Uh, and uh, Central America and uh, the Mexican-American that, you know, half of this country was Mexico. And so we can go on and on to history and say, wait a minute, when we're really talking immigrants, we're really talking Irish, we're talking Italians, we're talking uh, Eastern Europeans or Central Europeans. Listen. 
how would you feel if you live in New York, for just to mention an example, and uh, you lived in the first district or the second district or the third district in New York, and uh, they suddenly decide that the people in the second district are not going to vote for the president anymore. How would you feel about that? It's not right. You're an American citizen. You're a full-fledged American citizen. And you should have the rights that everybody else has. And this is what this is about. I think if the people of Puerto Rico speak decisively on the, on the issue, whichever way they go, uh, there will be enormous moral and political pressure on mainland Hispanics to support that outcome. As you know, we have um, come forth and, and supported self-determination for Puerto Rico without indicating what action we wish for them to take. I think only the Puerto, people of Puerto Rico can decide that. But in the event that they should decide that statehood is what they want, then um, if it is clearly their choice, then I think that the Hispanic community in this country is going to rally behind them. If they decide to become a state, and if they, if they vote and that's, what, that's the route they want to take, certainly LULAC will take a position in favor of supporting their right. Uh, number one, if Puerto Rico becomes a state, we have four, approximately four, four and a half million more Latinos that are counted in the census, uh, which means that there will be more monies allocated for Latinos. It will per allow Puerto Rico to be able to be part of the process uh, within the United States government and allow us to be able to tap into the resources of the United States government. It will allow us to increase, in my opinion, uh, the delivery of, go of goods, of services. And I think that that in itself would also be something that would help reignite the economy in Puerto Rico. Uh, by virtue of becoming a state, uh, it would probably be one of the top 20 states uh, in the United States uh, once, it, once it comes into the Union. Well, let me just say this, that it would make a, a significant difference. It, it would add to the Hispanic delegation. We would get an additional six or seven uh, members of Congress. We would also get, for the first time in a very long time, uh, two uh, Hispanic U.S. senators, which we don't have yet. If the people of Puerto Rico, the citizens of Puerto Rico, vote for statehood, uh, we would be totally in support of that. We would do everything we can to make sure that the Congress of the United States welcomes Puerto Rico as a state. Hispanics, we want to mainstream. We don't want to be separated from everything. And personally, I don't particularly care much about uh, when they say this is, this is a Hispanic issue and this is a black issue or this is a white issue. I think everything that goes on on Capitol Hill affects everybody. So there's no such thing as it's, it's one race or the other's issue. You know, this is, an, this is an American issue. And we are all Americans. Different backgrounds, we're all Americans. And so I think we have a real opportunity to show leadership and show that the in inclusion will win out over the exclusion that has been happening, unfortunately, for many, for many years. And the other is that I think that it's time for Hispanic uh, elected leaders to rise above small enclave uh, ethnic politics and really try to show leadership uh, for this nation. The U.S. Congress has shelved consideration of self-determination for Puerto Rico, concerned that the issue will distract from the upcoming election campaigns. But what I'm saying is that you have a responsibility under the Constitution, which you cannot deny, of making certain that this is uh, this unfinished business of you democracy that. You don't is need to finally it, resolved.